focuses on the introduction, section two, which focuses on the economic outlook, section three focuses on the review of electric mobility projects, programs and initiatives in Kenya, section four focuses on the stakeholder analysis, which we've undertaken, section five focuses on the policy review analysis and requirements, section six focuses on the analysis of electric mobility target setting tools, section seven, very interesting, focuses on the cost benefit analysis for the introduction and upscale of electric two and three wheelers in Kenya, and a case for a case study for a policy, a case study of tax policy shift. Section eight focuses on options for financing for electric mobility, and section nine focuses on the policy best practices. On to our next slide. So the first section will delve into the background, and under the background, we know that the e-mobility sector in Kenya is vibrant and dynamic, and it is growing very fast. The country has different e-bike assemblers, several large-scale adopters in the delivery and taxi sectors, retrofitters converting ICE, that is internal combustion engines, to electric options, developers of associated infrastructure, including charging stations, e-mobility-focused financiers, research associations, and the national electric utility, which is the Kenya Power. And Kenya has developed several policy documents, which in one way or another, directly and indirectly, touch on the e-mobility sector. So the next slide. So to understand the, the growth and development of e-mobility, one should also basically look at the UN Climate Change Conference, which happened last year in Glasgow, that was the COP26. And just to understand the COP26, we need to look at the targets which were proposed during that conference. And some of the targets which were which managed to secure, showed that the COP26 managed to secure a near global net zero nationally determined contributions from 153 countries. And to deliver on these stretching targets, COP26 agreed on the following commitments. One was to move away from coal power. Two, to halt and reverse deforestation. Three, to reduce emissions of methane. And four, to speed up switch to electric vehicles. And the purposes of the toolkit which UNEP is developing is basically to focus, focusing on commitment number four, to speed up the switch to electric vehicles. And for the next slide. Now, there are some, or there are a number of extensive commitments which were proposed during the COP26. And some of these commitments, I'll just touch on two key, two key ones. Over 35 countries, six major car makers, 43 states, cities, that is states and regions, 28 fleet owners, 15 financial institutions, and investors committed to work together towards accelerating the transition to 100% zero emission cars and vans. It's also important to note that the signing up of the EV100 pledge by more than 110 companies committing to fully zero emission vehicles by 2030. And if you look at this timing, which has been proposed, we notice that we are not far away from these targets, these timelines, which have been proposed here, because currently we are in 2022. So it shows that we only have actually close to seven, eight to seven years to attain these targets. So this shows that the time is limited, but even though the time is limited, we just need to put in place strategies and policies to move towards EVs. On to the next slide. Now, just to appreciate how the economies have been performing, more so post-2020, that is post the pandemic. We know Kenya's GDP expanded to 7.5% in 2021, which showed quite a remarkable growth. That was a good re recovery compared to negative 0.3% in 2020. And the per capita GDP also increased from Kenya shillings 179,000 in 2020 to Kenya shillings 190,000 in 2021, which registered a 6.1% increase. And it's important to note that per capita increase, basic per capita GDP shows the purchasing power of an economy. Now, overall inflation also increased marginally from 6.1% in 2021, in 2021 from 5.4% in 2020. And this marginal increase was mainly attributed to the increase in consumer goods such as petrol, kerosene and etc. Now the outlook shows that the economy will continue performing 
well, that is post-2022, shows that from 2023 onwards, this is according to the IMF outlook, the economy will grow by at 5.3%, whereas inflation will continue going up, but it will peter off around from 2023 onwards at 7.1%, which is still quite high. And to the next slide. To also understand the nature of electric mobility, as you're also developing the policy, it's also good to look at energy analysis of a country. And at present, the main source of uh, mobility is fuel. We normally use fuel for our activities to move from one place to another. And the sale of petroleum fuels by consumer category in 2021 showed that retail pump outlets and road transport consumes up to 75.8% of all the fuel that is imported in the country. Similarly, the value of petroleum imports in 2021 in Kenya stood at 345 billion Kenya shillings, which is quite significant. And also the price of fuel, the annual average price of fuel over the years, that is from 2017 all the way up to 2021 has also been increasing. That is both for diesel and petrol, as you can see from 2017, it was 100 shillings on average. And in 2021, it was 125 shillings. So this shows that the price of fuel is increasing. And as we all know, at the moment, the price is actually above this average, because currently we are at 159. So the next slide. In terms of the vehicle registrations, Kenya at the moment is registering up to up to 107,000. That is the latest statistics. It registered 107,499 vehicles. That is motor vehicles. Whereas for motorcycles, we are doing up to about 200,000 annually. Let's go to the next slide. In terms of the stock, the stock of vehicles which the country has, as of 2020, the stock of vehicles which the country had was approximately 3.954 million, with motorcycles and autocycles contributing the largest share of 1.9 million, showing closely to about 2 million, and motor vehicles about 1.1 million. It's important to note that these two categories represent the best opportunity for the switch for electric vehicles to occur. And we shall see this even as we continue in our analysis, which I'm going to present onto the next slide. So the second section which I'll focus on is the policy review and analysis together with the requirements. And as I've, as I've stated before, it's important to note that Kenya has developed quite a bit of policies over the past few years, which in one way or another touch on electric mobility. And some of the policies which we've managed to review in the toolkit is the integrated national transport policy for 209, which is the overall. And we're also aware that the ministry is currently updating it. And it's important to note that this policy was formulated to address the numerous challenges facing the transport sector. And the goal of the policy was to improve efficiency in the transport operation in Kenya. And it's important to note that road passenger transport policy covers both, it covers both public and private passenger movements on roads using buses, matatus, taxis, tour vehicles, light delivery vehicles, private motor cars, motorcycles, bicycles, as well as walking. Now, this policy recommends that the government should promote the use of more energy efficient and less polluting modes of transport. Most of the vehicles on Kenyan roads are internal combustion engines, and this ought to be gradually replaced by electric vehicles, which are energy efficient and reduce both pollution and noise. The policy also recommends the use of differential fuel prices to reduce pollution by having cleaner fuels and oils in place. And this could further be refined to include differential pricing for alternative sources of energy, such as electricity and hydrogen, which are more efficient and contribute towards emission and noise reduction. And to the next slide. The other policy that came into effect was the VAT Amendment Act of 2014. And this act solely focused on solar power, but it's important to note because this act showed that there was appetite towards uh, removing of some certain uh, taxation, taxes on, on solar powered uh, imports in the country. And uh, this act exempted solely, 
solar powered batteries used in solar power panels. And this exemption, however, did not include lithium ion batteries, which are a critical component of electric vehicles and which still attract 16% of VAT charge for importation. And the lack of exemption on this critical component acts as a catalyst in increasing the cost of electric vehicles in significantly in Kenya. And to the next slide. The other act of policy which we have analyzed is the Excise Duty Act number 23 of 2015 and 2017 revision. And this policy was dubbed as the proposed pollution-based charges for importation of second-hand vehicles. And this policy basically imposed an import declaration fee of 2.25% on the imported cars or Kenya shillings 5,000, whichever is higher. And import, it also imposed an import duty of 25% on the CIF value of the car, an excise duty of 20%, which includes both import duty plus CIF value respective of the engine size, and a VAT of 16% of the excise duty plus import duty plus CIF value. It's important to note that this policy, as at this time, it was applicable to both internal combustion engine vehicles and electric vehicles. So the next slide. Now, the Finance Act of 2019 registered a big win for electric vehicles because this was uh, a step in the right direction in terms of it lowered the excise duty rate of 100% elect electric powered motor vehicles to 10% and 20%. And this move was aimed at encouraging the uptake of such vehicles as a result of the global campaign aimed at adopting environmentally friendly technologies. To the next slide. Now, the Finance Act of 2022, because now it's an act, it came into effect in 1st July. This bill proposed to exempt locally manufactured vehicles with an aim of reducing their costs in Kenya. And the proposal was in line with the VAT proposal and was linked to a condition of ensuring that at least 30% of the parts are designed and manufactured in Kenya by an original equipment manufacturer, OEM, operating in the country. Now, the policy exempted locally manufactured vehicles which the old rate was 20 to 30 percent depending on the cc rating and fuel and the new rate was all these locally manufactured vehicles were exempted however this policy did not really specify whether this was applicable to evs and it would be good to see now moving forward perhaps this policy being extended to evs as well because it would be a step also in the right direction to the next slide The other strategy of policy which Kenya has developed is the Kenya National Energy Efficiency and Conser Conservation Strategy of 2020. And the Kenya National Efficiency and Conservation Strategy of 2020 targeted to increase the adoption of electric mobility in Kenya from 0% in 2019 to 5% in 2025. And this target seeks to increase the share of electric stock hybrid vehicles imported in Kenya annually in a move aimed at increasing e-mobility in the country. And to achieve the proposed targets, the strategy aims to use a mix of policy and regulatory measures, such as provision of incentives through lowering of import duty for electric cars, bicycles, and tuk tuks, lowering of vehicle road taxes, revising building codes by incorporating charging stations in public building and new estates, and awareness raising on energy efficiency vehicles and electric mobility. And to the next slide, and the next one. Just the next one. So just back one more. Yes, the other key policy to evaluate is the National Energy and Petroleum Policy of 2018. And the overall objective of the Energy and Petroleum Policy was to ensure affordable, competitive, sustainable, and reliable supply of energy to meet national and county development needs at least cost while protecting and conserving the environment. And the prop policy proposed the following key points under environment, health, and safety, which are crucial for e-mobility. The phasing out of the importation of two-stroke motorcycles, carrying out of public education sensitization programs on benefits of clean fuels and when maintained vehicles, and promoting the use of public transport and non-motorized transport, and provisions of incentives for acquisition of use of fuel-efficient technologies in motor vehicles. So all these policy analyses which we've done in one way or another touch on EVs, 
but we are aware of the fact that the Ministry of Transport currently in Kenya is in the process of recruiting a consultant to develop an e-mobility policy. And that policy will now be, be provide the overarching policy document which will guide the e-mobility sector. On to the next slide. Now, the toolkit also has examined the different scenarios which the e-mobility sector can generate savings or generate benefits to the economy. And we've carried out undertaken some scenario modeling. And one scenario is that we have adopted two scenarios where one is the e-mobility, the business as usual scenario. And the other one is the electric mobility scenario. The business as usual scenario assumes that the share of battery electric vehicles will remain at 0% throughout the entire period of analysis, which is up to 2050. And it assumes that the share of ICE vehicles will continue to grow and will con continue to consume petrol whose price will continue to increase sharply. Whereas the e-mobility scenario assumes that the share of battery electric vehicles will continue to grow with sales projected to reach 75% in 2030 and 100% in 2050. And these vehicles will use electricity as their main source of fuel. Onto the next slide. And now the results which the study has been able to derive has shown that both for motorcycles, light duty vehicles, and for buses, if we move towards this strategy, the country will adopt quite significant savings in terms of fuel cost savings and vehicle maintenance savings. And for the case of motorcycles, we can see that the country could adopt, could actually by 2050 could be saving up to 429 billion Kenya shillings in terms of fuel cost savings. To the next slide, just want to touch, I want to focus mainly on fuel. For the case of buses, the country could be saving up to close to 1 trillion Kenya shillings in terms of fuel cost savings if we adopt, if, if, if we are to go the e-mobility way. And to the next slide, for the case of light duty vehicles. And for the case of light duty vehicles, the savings which could be accrued in terms of fuel costs would be close to 1 trillion as well. So this shows that as much as we move towards EVs, the country is likely to have a lot of benefits or savings or to, to realize a lot of savings in terms of fuel cost savings. And the next slide will focus on now an analysis of a policy shift towards EVs. And here we've done a cost benefit analysis for the introduction and upscale of electric two and three wheelers in Kenya, and a case study of a tax policy shift. And there are various drivers for growth of e-mobility sector in Kenya. And one is emission reduction targets, which the country has. The second one is the high growth market for vehicles in the country. The third one is the fiscal and non-fiscal measures which have already been put in place by the government. Fourth one is the availability of clean energy. And the fifth one is the alignment to government policies. On to the next slide. Now it's important to understand the tax structure that currently exists in the country between the ICE, that is the internal combustion engines and the electric vehicles. And this one should understand it in terms of the import duty, excise duty, VAT, import declaration fee, and the railway development levy. And as we can see in the screen, in our screens in front of us, ICE vehicles attract uh, import duty of 25%, both for the four and three wheelers and the two wheelers. But as for electric vehicles, they attract an import duty of 25% and 35% for lithium batteries. So you see the battery is charged separately and the vehicle is charged separately. In terms of excise duty, Depending on the size of the vehicle, for ICE vehicles, it is 25% and 30%. And for motorcycles, it's Kenya shillings to 12,185 per unit. Whereas for electric vehicles, it is 10%. Then there's the VAT, which is, in, in, which is also charged at 16%. And we have the import declaration fee together with the railway development levy. Now, all these taxes, what they do is they contribute towards the increase in cost for EVs. On to the next slide. Now, given that we know that Kenya has a target of electrifying its vehicle fleet by 2025 to 5%,
we carried out some projections on the number of vehicles which will be registered in the country by 2025. And we noted that about 152,000 vehicles will be registered in the country by 2025. And in terms of motorcycles, about 20,000. No, not sorry, about 403,663 will be registered in 2025, newly registered. Now, 5% of this would be 20,000 motorcycles, which would be required to be electric in the economy. Now, the next slide will show us now the benefits of now moving towards electric, electrifying the motorcycle sector. And our analysis has looked at two detailed scenarios, and we have our scenario one, which is the base case, which assumes that the government will continue to impose taxes, that is the import duty, excise duty, VAT, IDF, and the railway development levy. And the aggressive case assumes that the government will zero rate most of these taxes for a period of basically five years to increase the uptake of EVs. Go to the next slide. And here we have the two scenarios which we have. We have the electric two-wheelers. We have a low growth scenario and a high growth scenario showing that under the low growth scenario, they'll increase 1,000 every year to reach 5,000. And under the high growth, they'll increase 5,000 to reach 25,000. Whereas the ice will reduce by a simil the sim same amount under the two scenarios. On to the next slide. Now, this analysis has adopted some key crucial parameters. We've also ad assumed that the motorcycles are doing an annual average kilometers of 30,000 every year. They have an energy use of four kilowatts per, ki per 100 kilometers for electric two-wheelers and the ice. And energy per year as well is also calculated at about 1,200 kilowatts per hour. Fuel price has also been adopted at 0 0.2 per US dollars. And the annual cost in terms of USD for electric two wheelers is 211 and for ICE is 1,411. And these parameters have now been used to model the electric mobility calculator, which we've developed. And the results are as shown now in the next slide. Now, having a policy tax policy shift will generate savings in tax, tax expenditures to the economy. In terms of just allowing 5,000 motorcycles over the next five years, the country will likely save, or the consumers will likely save a tax, or the foregone tax income, which would be paid to the government, would be about 4.4 .4 billion Kenya shillings, or 4.4 .4 million USD. That's under the low growth scenario, and under the high growth scenario, it would be 2. Point, actually 22 billion Kenya shillings, 22 million USD. That is about 22 billion Kenya shillings. Whereas under the savings in energy cost expenditure, the country would also realize in terms of usage of the difference between the usage of electricity in terms of the cost used to power the motorcycles and usage of fuel there would be huge savings under the low growth scenario, assuming these motorcycles are doing 30,000 kilometers per year and they're operating for five years. Under the low growth scenario, it would be 18 million USD. Whereas under the high growth scenario, it would be 90 million USD. These are the savings in energy cost expenditures, which would be realized in the economy. And the savings in the forex exchange from reduced gasoline imports under the low growth scenario would be 7.9 million USD, which is about 700 million, uh, 700 million Kenya shillings. And under the high growth scenario, this would be 39.5 million USD, which is about 3.95 billion Kenya shillings. So what this shows is, onto the next slide. What this shows is a more a, a tax policy shift towards zero rating. Some of these taxes would actually increase the uptake of electric mobility, and it would even have a multiplier effect because the charges which consumers incur in terms of the tax charges and the energy charges and the savings also in uh, the savings in uh, fuel imports, that money could be directed to other uses, such as for the government, that money could be directed towards even increasing this, the numbers of charging ports in the economy. 
for the case of the consumers, the savings in energy costs and savings in tax could also help them increase their vehicle fleet in the economy. Thank you very much. Open the floor for questions. Yeah, thanks a lot, David. This, this was a uh, very detailed, lots of numbers, but super interesting to see you know, the economic impact and the benefits that actually a shift to electric mobility can have. And uh, there's actually already two questions in the chat. So one is from uh, Aditya Banjelie. Um, what were the assumptions underpinning the growth numbers in the two and three wheeler use case? Yes, so, so at the moment we we know that the Kenya has a target of having 5% of its vehicle fleet being electric. So we did projections of the current registrations of uh, the vehicle fleet and we established that 5% of the registered motorcycles or the two wheelers, two and three wheelers in 2025 would be 20,000. So which was about 20,000 would be required to be registered by uh, 2025. But we assume that given that we are just giving an analysis to show what could be the effect of the tax, uh, zero rating some of these taxes on the motorcycle industry, basically the two and three wheelers, we assumed a low growth of motorcycles increasing by 1,000 annually and a high growth of motorcycles increasing by 5,000 annually, just to show what the differences could be. Yeah. Thanks a lot. And I see another very interesting question in the chat that I was also wondering from Dr. Eugenie Tua about, uh, did you also uh, look at the benefits uh, in relation to climate change and environment? I mean, I guess it refers to quantifying the, the CO2 emissions reduction and air pollution. I guess I like also note the impact on, on health from air pollution. That's also a big economic impact, I guess, right? Yes, we, the calculators, the model which we've developed has looked at into all this. As I just said for this presentation, I was just giving a brief overview of what we've looked at, but we've looked at all this. And for the case of the savings in uh, environment and climate change, there will be significant savings in terms of reduced vehicle pollution and also reduced emissions. And that would increase over the years. I think it was increasing from around 500 CO2 tons of CO2 to about 60,000 over that just the five year period. But yes, the model has looked into it. Great. And, and then I think that's another follow up also on this uh, regarding the, the social considerations. I don't know if that refers to the impacts on 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 drivers, um, because no, as you mentioned, there's there's going to be a, a big uh, savings in fuel costs. And of course, that means lower operating costs, which of course will then benefit uh, the, the the people that earn incomes by, by using vehicles, right? Yes. Yeah, perfect. And then the other uh, issue, I don't know if that, that's not uh, directly related to, to your presentation, but maybe you have a thought on this uh, in terms of the, the challenge with battery use uh, and charging. Um, I mean, a solution to this, of course, there, there are several solutions how, how to deal with batteries, not like you need to plan from the beginning on. Uh, what what will be the the second use, for example, of these batteries? Because as as we know, like after the the use in electric vehicles, there's still um, uh, a capacity left, for example, no for battery storage applications. And I think there's many startups in in Kenya, for example, who are also working on this. Um, and uh, then there's also uh, another question um, regarding. Uh, the, is the 35% duty charged on EV batteries charged on batteries imported separately uh, and not on the batteries mounted on the EV? Do you have an answer to this, David? From the tax structure which we have from uh, which we, which I presented, it's charged separately on the batteries because and this mainly affects the case of the two and three wheelers because you know the batteries come separate in terms of whether it's a knockdown kit, completely knockdown kit or, or a completely built unit. So some, you know, they bring the motorcycles, which are the knockdown units separately and the batteries separately. So the charge is usually on a different, it's normally not on, on, the, on, the, on the vehicle itself, it's different for just bringing the batteries, for, for those guys who are doing like the battery swapping initiative. Yeah. Correct. And also there's another question. I think that's also something that, that you've looked at, no, into incentives for local 
localizing vehicle assembly, you know, because I know in Kenya that that's in general like local assembly is, is incentivized with zero tax rating. I don't know if there's any consideration of giving uh, like uh, preferring EV assembly rather than ICE vehicle assembly in Kenya. Yes. So now you see that's that's what the policy, even the policy which the Ministry of Transport will look into. Those are some of the things that now they need to push for because already there's appetite for exemption of some of these taxes, mainly on the ICE vehicles. And just this also should be extended to the EVs because if it's extended to the EVs, then it will make even EVs be more competitive with the ICE in the ICE market. Because at the moment, it's difficult for EVs to compete in the ICE market with these exemptions on the ICE uh, vehicles. Yeah. Thanks. And this is actually a very, very interesting uh, question and comment here from Munashe on the who's in the lead in developing e-mobility policies in, in the countries. Now, because as, as you touched upon, there's you need the Ministry of Energy and Transport and Finance and Climate and Environment. Uh, is there uh, like a coordination structure in Kenya um, or is there a leading agency that that's uh, uh, pushing the agenda forward? Yes. At the moment, the Ministry of Transport under the State Department of Transport is leading in developing an e-mobility policy for Kenya. They're in the process of getting a consultant uh, to develop an e-mobility policy. And once this policy is up and running, it will guide all the electric mobility activities in the country. So it's the Ministry of Transport that is in charge, but they are working together with the Ministry of Energy. All, you know, it's, 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 it's a multifaceted uh, initiative together with KEBS, together with that's the Kenya Bureau of Standards, together with the Ministry of Environment, together with the Ministry of Energy. So they are all working together. Yeah, yeah, no, it's definitely an, an effort that has to be done with different institutions. There cannot be only one. Uh, because definitely there, there's the club. So like in many countries, now we're also at UNEP supporting the establishing of like interministerial committees on e-mobility, you know, like working groups uh, where they can discuss the, these times, which is because not only the industry, as I said, it's also not the Bureau of Standards, uh, it's urban planning agencies as well, right? If you look at charging infrastructure and if you use then at the public uh, transport electrification, and we have to consider bus operators, um, because there was also a question regarding uh, Namata, so the, the Nairobi Metropolitan Transport Agency. So this is also, of course, a very important stakeholder uh, in, in, in this whole topic. Um, and then there's another, as, as also there's a question around um, about electricity consumption per kilowatt hour or per miles of driving. No, that's also hints to that. No, the, the utilities are a very uh, important actor in this uh, to um, not define what tariffs uh, will be charged for a charging for EVs now, which uh, at the moment is per, per kilowatt hour. But of course, if it's per miles, that depends on the business model. If, for example, uh, now a company is providing this service, then they can uh, charge now uh, the uh, per miles. Um, but yeah, in general, that the, the, it's per kilowatt hour. And then there's also an important question about road safety issues uh, uh, with regards to electric two and three wheelers. And that's actually a topic that also at UNEP we are we are looking into, like the impact of electrification on uh, urban planning and in general the urban space because um, I mean the the change is not because I mean the only difference would probably be that the noise impact right but in general uh, we right already have two and three lists on the road so it's more about making these uh, more efficient and integrated and I think immobility e is a big chance not to consider local planning issues and then maybe uh, Francois from uh, Kigali can also uh, uh, mention something on this uh, since he, he's been working on this topic on the ground as well. Um, and then maybe the, the last question that I'll, I'll take now, because then we still have um, a lot more uh, 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 time for, for questions later after the, the presentations from uh, our, our friends and colleagues from Rwanda. Um, is there anything between uh, the, the um, uh, cooperation between the national and subnational level in Kenya? I think many issues now are focusing on, on Nairobi here, but is there any mechanism how the municipalities or, or regions are involved uh, in, in setting the, the policy directions on e-mobility. That's meant for me, Annika? Yes, please, David, if you yes. can. You see, at, at the moment, uh, given that the policy is yet to come into effect, uh, activities, everyone is doing activities in the country. But once the policy comes into effect, the policy will be able to guide on how engagements are to be done at the national level and how engagements are to be done at 
the lo at the county level. So at the moment, most of the activities are mainly concentrated in Nairobi. With even in, from our stakeholder analysis, we've been able to establish that most of the activities are mainly concentrated in Nairobi, but there are some EV players who have ventured out of Nairobi and slowly by, and they have also faced numerous challenges, mainly from the counties in terms of setting up even charging stations. But once the policy comes into effect, most of these things will have to be addressed at the policy level. Great. Thanks a lot, David. And yeah, there's more questions coming in. So definitely very insightful presentation. And uh, we can definitely spend more time uh, on, on this. But now I would actually, I'm very excited to, to hear, to move over to Rhonda. Um, and I think with us is, is Francois from the city of Kigali. Um, I don't know, Francois, if you can hear us and uh, if you can share uh, the presentation from your end. Yes, hi everyone. I, I can hear you very well. Let me share my presentation. Perfect, thanks. We can hear and see you well. Can you see it? Yes, thanks. You can just, yeah, presentation mode. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Francois Ricana. I work for the state of Sigari as the e-mobility specialist. I'm going to tell you about the transport decarbonization in the state of Kigali, but uh, with emphasis on electric mobility. So those of who have not been in the state of Kigali, the state of Kigali is a quite a small city of the, the capital state of the of, of the Republic of Rwanda. So with elevation of uh, 1,767 meters and the area of uh, 730 kilometers squared, as long as a population of around 1.3 meters. So once you come to get to Rwanda, we have the famous uh, Gorilla Mountain, Gorilla River back, so you will be able to visit. So, so when we go back, we continue with uh, our initiatives. So we, we, we have a lot of initiatives aiming at the reduction of carbon emissions in the state of Shigari. So one is the non motorized transport, which includes the bike share scheme. We have a, a partnership with the Gura Ride. We introduced the bike share system in order to promote the walking and the cycling so that people can reduce the dependence on the motor vehicles. In addition to the bike, we have also the car free zone in the car free days. So we have now three car free zones as well as we have a demand three car free days so that people can work more other than uh, taking the motor vehicles. Now, in addition it's to walking, cycling, we now to moving to electric mobility, but most importantly, we want it to be more inclusive, uh, including more women in this uh, journey toward the city mobility. In order to reduce the number of vehicles on the road, we are also introducing, we, we are improving the transport as well as the, we want to, to introduce the decreased bus lanes, which will be later tra translated into the, the BRT. Now, in addition to those, we have other legal measures to reduce emissions such as the approval of uh, Euro 4 standards. And also we have the other implementing measures that aim at reducing the old motorcycles. Currently, only around the importation of motorcycles, they are brand new ones, unless they are de de designed for sports or, or people with disability. And then when you go to vehicle inspection, you have the uh, regular vehicle inspection. So once uh, you, you don't comply, you can't get certificates for road roadworthiness. And you also conducted the mobile uh, spots for emissions. Once you exceed the road emissions, you, you, you need to pay fines. In addition to that, we are considering to induce the five year old maximum of auto vehicles, as was recommended by 
East African Community Head of State. So we also we are also developing a concept to introduce the carbon tax so that people can really reduce the dependence on the uh, uh, debt fuel. And the last we have the promotion of physical mobility by provision of incentives, both physical and non-physical incentives. Now, as we know, not only the cigarette, but in general, electric mobility has many benefits, such as their efficiency, uh, it's cheaper to run, and of course, low emission is in the noise, and of course, we, 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 we can reduce the dependence on the fuel product. And finally, uh, we have, for us, we have the surplus for electricity, so we, we want to reduce uh, to, to we, not, we want to reduce that surplus by by increasing the consumption and the emission control. Even if when you are producing electricity, you can pollute, but as long as you can control emission is on the plant, on, on the plant, it can be that easier. Then we have a commitment uh, as the state of Chigari, but that comes from the national level. We have a national transport policy and strategy. And that one has a component of uh, uh, electric mobility. And there is another strategic paper on electric mobility adoption in Rwanda. This one has incentives such as the tax exemption, as well as uh, the electricity uh, tariff and the, and the others. So currently when you bring a vehicle in Rwanda, when it is electric, you don't pay any tax. And you consume, uh, even for uh, electricity tariff, it is lower than other normal consumptions. Now, when it comes to, to the state of Chigari, we are also in the final stage of developing our mobility strategy for the state of Chigari, which has those also uh, targets from deducing uh, the, 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 the from the national targets. So we also have uh, we have a strong commitment in leadership for the city. Currently, the city has established electric mobility technical committee. This one is bringing together all stakeholders involved in the e-mobility subsector so that people can discuss together for efficiency uh, and the progress and as well as intervention is on its time where, where are necessary. Then in addition to that, we are partnering with the Solution Class project where uh, we have a uh, support of uh, trainings as well as the, the startups uh, supports in, in the training as well as development of uh, 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 enable documents that can support the city to improve the penetration of air mobility. Then currently in the state of Chigari, all, all initiatives in the country, they are now concentrated in the state of Chigari in terms of electric mobility. We have in total 720 motorcycle, e motorcycles. We have 163 motor vehicles and, 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 the, and the 162 charging and the swapping stations. For motors, they prefer to use the swapping system rather than the charging. And in the total, the fleet, you have 875 combined the motorcycles and as well as the, the motor vehicles. Then, Currently, we don't have electric bus, but we we are in journey and and, and, and we, we want to bring them in the state of Sigari. But most importantly, now we have the challenge not only the government but also the private private sector. Currently, our full transport is run by private sector, so when it comes to capital cost, is high. And uh, but uh, we, we we as the city explore the total cost of ownership so that we can and interest people to, to come and invest public transport using the electric buses. Now, sorry, it seems my, I missing. Now, when we say the total cost of ownership, what are we talking about? We are talking about the fixed cost, the operational cost, as well as the variable cost. This one is that give us the top cost of ownership per kilometer of the vehicle when it's set to the model. 
that was explaining it is that the, the total sum of all costs involved in the purchase operation maintenance of uh, a bus in its lifetime. Now, uh, now the total cost of ownership. When we we, we see the, the the rates for penetration of vertical buses, it's a zero, and we are trying to see what what can we contribute, and the contribution is will become vis-a-vis -vis the total cost of ownership. But this is the key barrier to purchase. So currently, the cost of for e bus is really higher than the professional bus, and we 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 assume that as the the time of technology and the fuel increase, the price can be low. But currently, when it seems to be higher, we are we are trying to examine how we can we can support. Now, when we we have this, what what are we targeting? We target the policymakers that can really offer the evidence to design the financial incentives, and of course the fleet owners and operators. So there's assessments for the business viability. And of course, the consumers. That means when you want to own a, 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 a car, it's it's really necessary to know the total cost of ownership. <laughs> then we we did a, a really pilot for the city. We analyzed the one, uh, one corridor, one route, uh, concerning those three parameters: the capital cost, operational cost, and the vehicle. Vehicle details. So for us, we have we have the ICE business as a model, and then you have the battery tech buses. When you see the cost on on the market now, the cost of for conventional buses is 120 thousand USD, but for for the e bus is almost 300. So when you you have a, the you you cons, you convert the tax exemption into money, it is almost seventy nine thousand USD, and when you put the charging infrastructure now for bus, it's, it's almost a six six thousand USD, and the lifetime for now is twenty years, and you when you consider that someone has been has borrowed a loan from the bank, the interest is here sixty. 16%. So those are the parameters. You have the, 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 the size, the 12, you have the working time, you have the capacity, you have the train, the, the cigar is, is, is here, it has a heavy train that also have it to impact the, the energy consumption. And of course you have the right, the, you, you, you will have it to replace a battery, for example, once uh, after eight years, you have also to consult the, the part, battery replacement cost. And the degradation, as you you use the battery, has it has degradation, and when it is a fully charged, one hundred percent, but it can't be lower fifteen percent if you want to, you, if you want to 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 make sure that it is not degraded degraded easily, and the charging strategy would be the overnight with opportunity charging in the depots. Uh, sorry, the depots you you put to the overnight charging. And then in the terminals, you put opportunity charging. Then these are the operations. We have the, the operation for IC, you have operation for the electric bus. This is the total kilometer, the number of days per year, and the, the vehicle life. But I want to show you the result actually, that's what I'm aiming. You see, in this left, left side, if you we don't provide incentives. After six years, that's where the cost of the total cost of ownership for ICE will go higher than the cost of ownership for, for, for electric bus. That is after seven, six years when we don't provide incentives. But the provision of incentives we introduced, after three years, someone will be able to 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 get more benefit than someone having ICE bus. When you see this this the paragraph, you will see that the fuel emissions, consumption emissions, cost, the IC is higher. And when you come to 
the total cost of ownership, you will see that the, the, for the, 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 investment, the investment, that's where we have electric buses higher, but when you see the total cost of ownership, the busy electric bus is really profitable. So those are the analysis I see and the electric buses. You see the total cost of ownership for e-bus is lower than the ICE. The investment of course is higher, this is lower. Those are some, so, some comparisons. But the most important when you see the total cost of ownership, we see that the ICE is higher than the the ethic buses when the, the incentives are provided so i don't want to take much time but the conclusion we took is that once incentives are provided operation operating an e bus can be more or profitable and can is is showing the good results and after analyzing the pilot and seeing that is possible and profitable to so introduce the e bus what is now the, the what's now the the moving forward? So we are engaging the stakeholders, and we are soon need to to start the pilot project. Currently, we are discussing the World Bank, and the discussion are really far. We have also the I, IFC, and we have the public, our public transport operators who operate buses in the state of Tigari. We have manufacturers. We have a GGI, and we have the Urban Electric Mobility Initiatives. All those stakeholders we are now currently. In, in a discussion, but anybody who can really wants to join our journey to introduce the e-bus, the doors are open. So I have been very fast so that we, we use our time efficiently, but we're able to answer any question. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you. This was great and it actually touches a lot on because there were lots of questions in the chat actually about buses. So it looks like you, you saw the questions coming. So it's very nice that you went in depth a bit on the TCO analysis for, for electric buses in Kigali and very excited to, to see that you're now starting to develop a pilot after already um, being very successful with the pilot electric uh, two wheelers uh, in Kigali. Now that buses is of course a, a bigger chunk, but uh, looks like you have a lot of partners on board for this and, and you're well prepared to to move forward with this uh, pilot project. So um, yeah, we'll definitely have you back here uh, later uh, to, to tell us about how, how this is moving forward. Um, and actually, uh, I know we had to uh, shift around the agenda a bit because John Veer was busy in another meeting, but I think he's with us now. He's from the Ministry of Infrastructure of Rwanda uh, and can take us back to the national level on what uh, Rwanda has done. And then after that, I think we can have the combined questions to our to uh, colleagues and, and experts from Rwanda. So, uh, Janvier, I don't know if, if you can, sh if you want to share the presentation from your end or if you want me to do it. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I think you can hear me. Yes, we can. <coughs> uh, apologies, I was taken in another equally important meeting, but now I'm here. Uh, that's what matters. And the, uh, I'm sorry, I don't uh, manage to to share the screen, maybe you can no. assist. I will do that, yeah, no problem. Okay. I hope you, you can see it. Yes, now I can see it and hope that everybody is seeing it. Uh, this is just a brief, uh, a brief uh, presentation in the Rwanda journey toward the electrification of mobility. As my, as Anita said, I'm called Jean-Vier Palimana from the Ministry of Infrastructure. And I have been following up this uh, electrification of mobility since uh, 2018 when the government of Rwanda started this initiative. Next, please. Yeah, those are just the outline of our, our presentation today. Introduction and rationale, government agenda toward electrification of mobility, and in general, climate, uh, I mean, climate, uh, uh, combating climate destruction, approved incentives, current status of electric vehicle fleet, then a bit of uh, conducted analytical works that we have conducted around EV sphere because we know that uh, knowledge uh, on this is very key. So <clears throat> as my colleague uh, might have said uh, previously, transport in Rwanda is uh, mostly, has been mostly uh, depending on imported fossil fuel. As all, all of us knows, uh, the IC vehicles have these uh, 
problems associated with it, which are air pollution, which are hazardous to health, noise pollution, and the greenhouse gases, which lead to the climate changes. And we are now starting to see uh, the, the, the impact, uh, not only in Rwanda, but worldwide. Again, we have realized that we have an over-dependency on fossil fuel because Rwanda as a country doesn't have the oil refinery and doesn't produce oil. So it means that we need to uh, take the money that is in the country and then go buy a fuel from the producing countries. Uh, different studies have been conducted, different inventories have been conducted. Like in 2015, if you can see on the slide, uh, we had a number of many emissions that are being resulting from the transport sector. And if nothing is done, if we keep the current status, the emissions will grow and the transport has about 300, 300, uh, 302 kiloton CO2 equivalent in 2006. And it is the major among the uh, one uh, sector. So um, uh, uh, bearing in mind of the, all this, uh, recognizing this, electric mobility was thought as one of the solution to address these issues that we have highlighted before. Next please. So uh, uh, again, as I said, uh, government of Rwanda aware of this, uh, put forward a plan to reduce the, the, the climate, uh, the emissions from the transport and also from other sectors. In that, uh, since 2018, as I said, in 19, in 2019, on August, uh, when uh, His Excellency, uh, the President of the Republic of Rwanda, announced that uh, government of Rwanda is willing to shift to electric mobility as a solution. So here, Rwanda encourages the shift to electric uh, vehicle as a part of the action plan to promote the green mobility, reduce em air emission and pollution, and also uh, improve the air quality, which to a certain, uh, to during some time in Kigali uh, mostly, uh, uh, air quality is below the recommended uh, levels of UN. So we are aware of this. His Excellency set an example, and we are following up in that. Uh, from that time, we conducted a study. My colleague Francois may might have said something on it, which highlighted a number of targets uh, to be achieved by 2030. Well, considering different uh, uh, different um, proportion of vehicles, being electric motorcycle, electric cars, electric buses, and electric trucks and mini uh, or micro buses. This is the overall uh, national targets, but we with the current trend that we are seeing on electric motorcycle, we believe that by 2030, we'll be having 100%. So we are about to, uh, again, uh, revise this target. Next, please. So, uh, after the study, as I have said, the study that we conducted in 2019, which highlighted that electric uh, mobility is possible, is feasible, uh, but that government needed to create a very conducive environment for them to uh, to materialize as quick as possible as the government of Rwanda was wanting it. So, uh, cabinet in 2021, in April, cabinet of ministers approved a strategic uh, note uh, in, included in the national transport policy and strategy of Rwanda, uh, whereby a number of incentives were <clears throat> uh, approved by the government to attract electric transport or electric vehicles. Those incentives, as my colleague highlighted before, include the incentive, uh, physical incentives, non-physical incentive, and, and other administrative measures. If I can go uh, quickly, we have, first of all, on the tariff. 
uh, because we wanted to, in, in the same time, we want to reduce the capex of electric bus, electric vehicles. We want also to keep reducing the operation uh, expenditures, the OPEX, in order to attract uh, the quick penetration of EVs. In that, in that category, uh, government allow that electric vehicles charging station uh, be uh, treated and be given an, a specific tariff, which is, the, which is the lowest, what we call the large industry category. And also everyone having an electric vehicle being a commercial vehicle or non-commercial vehicle be entitled to have <clears throat> a reduced tariff during the off-peak time. That was one for the tariff. Then electric vehicles being buses, uh, motorcycles are uh, VAT exempted. Actually, they are um, uh, duty and levies exempted. And again, <clears throat> in order to, sorry, <clears throat> in order to uh, attract even the assemblies in the countries, all the vehicles, electric vehicles and their spare, spare parts, especially spare uh, parts which are linked to the electric drive train are, uh, are, um, are treated as VAT zero rated products. Meaning that uh, not only the vehicles or the spare parts are VAT uh, exempted, but also inputs that are used to manufacture electric vehicle or to assemble, to assemble electric vehicles are also VAT uh, exempted. Again, we have, uh, we also, we are in the plan also to introduce the carbon tax to discourage polluting vehicles. Next. As I have highlighted before, we have a uh, uh, fiscal incentive, but also we have non-fiscal incentives, again, to uh, create this conducive environment that I have been talking about, or uh, to have electric vehicles and uh, quicken the uh, the penetration of electric vehicles. We government allows that there will be a land free land for charging station, especially for lands that are owned by government. If um, a promoter of electric vehicle uh, found a strategic one land that is owned by government uh, for it for his business. He can get it free of charge. Uh, I mean, it can get the free land. Again, uh, as my colleague have, might have say, might have said, uh, we are in the process of uh, um, creating dedicated bus lanes or uh, high occupancy vehicle lanes, and here electric vehicles will be allowed to pass without. Uh, being stopped by the police, if I can say so. Then we have to provide uh, electric uh, vehicle charging station in the building code because initially that provision was not was not there. Again, we are in the process of seeing how electric vehicles can be given a green license plate so that it can be easier when they are using the dedicated bus lanes for the easy recognition uh, are not being stopped. Next, please. Next, yes. Uh, so, yes, there. We have uh, administrative measures and other measures. These just consist on enforcing the emission, vehicle emission standards that we um, uh, currently, Rwanda has adopted the Euro 4 standards, emission standards. So we want to we we, are start, we have started actually to enforce that uh, in order to reduce the emissions again as I have said and we have we have already done it establish restricted zone for green transport uh, where we started with the city of Kigali in the city of Kigali where we have some zones which are not uh, allowable for the uh, vehicles uh, the polluting vehicles. Again, we want to regulate importation of used vehicle by imposing age limit as per, as this is much aligned with the ESC uh, heads of state uh, recommendations. We are in the process of seeing how the 
to impose the age limit on the importation of vehicles. Uh, lastly, on the administrative measures, uh, provide the preference to electric vehicle for government hired vehicles. Actually, what we are saying here is uh, government used to hire vehicles, uh, transporting staff on duties. So uh, a company or companies that will be having electric vehicle will be given preference. And these have started in the tender that are ongoing now. Other measures is just uh, for the manufacturing companies and the assembling uh, of electric vehicles where they are given uh, many incentives, especially the tax holidays, irrespective of the investment value. Initially, uh, in the uh, investment code that the Rwanda is using, normally an investor uh, is given tax holiday when um, the investment value is about 50 million USD. But when uh, an investor uh, is in the um, arena of uh, electric mobility is given tax holiday regardless of amount of investment that he's putting, he's bringing in the country. Next, please. Yes, uh, this, I am not going to spend much time on this because my colleagues, uh, Francois said, uh, have highlighted this. Uh, we have uh, actually, um, uh, briefly, we have five, uh, five companies uh, that we know that are operating in the uh, electric mobility. We have Ampersand for e-motorcycles, Safi Universal links and the Rwanda electric motorcycles, working mostly on electric vehicles and um, electric motorcycles. Then we have Victoria Autofast and Volkswagen Mobility with these numbers of fleet already in the country. But uh, good, uh, to note here is that we have started also the retrofitting of, of the existing uh, motorcycles. Uh, so far, eight uh, motorcycles have been retrofitted and are working very well. We are, we are experiencing, I mean, we have, uh, we are witnessing this, uh, the retro, retrofitting of electric vehicles. Next, please. So, as I have said, uh, we, uh, because electric mobility being at infant stage, being at, uh, um, uh, we had had the situations where people were afraid to uptake electric vehicles, thinking that being a new technology is linked with many problems. So, awareness and understanding was needed in that context. Uh, together with our development partners and our um, and the others, uh, uh, people and the other uh, stakeholders, we conducted a number of studies, apart from the uh, national study that we highlighted before, we have conducted the, a number of studies uh, together with our development partners, uh, like this study on electric bus concept validation in Kigali that my colleague, uh, uh, Francois mentioned about um, is a study which provided a comprehensive analysis and a proof of concept on the feasibility of e-buses and e-vehicle as a model for large-scale deployment to the rest of Rwanda. This study was actually conducted in 10 uh, cities across the globe and, and Kigali was selected and this highlighted how feasible again electric buses is possible and under which con condition and who can do what to have electric buses working in the city of Kigali. After this, as you might be aware or all of us knows, the charging infrastructure is the backbone of any uh, electric uh, bus system. Uh, in that context, uh, with the help of GGGI, Triple GI, uh, we conducted a study uh, to assess the feasibility of electrification buses, especially looking at different uh, charging infrastructure variants, whereby we, uh, we, we had to choose or uh, investigate different type, typology, looking at the context of Rwanda, which one can work better. So we, this study has completed and we have shown a number of results 
and we saw that regardless of uh, the uh, topography of the country, electric mobility can work in different uh, corridors and it was assessed to be uh, very feasible. Next, please. Uh, then Solution Plus demonstration project under EU funding. My colleague, Prasan, might have said something on that uh, because he has been following up this project. Then we uh, lastly conducted an inclusive and electric last mile connectivity study under the World Bank funding, whereby we were assessing the, um, the, the potential role of electric last mile connectivity modes because Kigali or Rwanda in general, actually it's the whole East Africa, we have like particularities whereby we have um, last mile connectivity that is being uh, done by motorcycles, bicycles and, and so forth. So this study actually wanted to see uh, how uh, feasible uh, electric vehicles, um, electric uh, last mile connectivity means can work together with other uh, mass transport to provide a transportation that is uh, uh, suitable to uh, the, 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 the population of Rwanda and the region in general. Next. I think that was the last slide. I thank you very much. And uh, if there's any question, please feel free to ask. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot, Gianni. This is great. And yeah, also thanks to Francois again. I think this showed very well how the national and local level need to work together in terms of electric mobility policies now, because we saw how some of the policies that uh, the ministry has put in place were then later no, adopted also on the local level, but also on the other way around, how like a city can also lead on e-mobility, like uh, where what David mentioned about fiscal policies in, in Kenya. This is always a a uh, very political and, and, and long-term process, right? But then there's like quick actions that can be done in the city level, like you know, access zones, uh, supporting uh, companies to pilot vehicles, uh, last mile connectivity. So these are all things that can be done you know, with, without the fiscal measures on the national level. So I think this is very interesting to see in, in the Rwandan case. And actually, there's one question that was asked earlier for Kenya, which I would like to pass to Jambier about what were the key drivers in Rwanda for e-mobility? Because we see all these benefits, emissions reductions, air pollution, uh, economic growth, um, availability of fiscal, fiscal matters, uh, renewable energy. Uh, what do you think is the main driver in Rwanda to, to, to be kind of want to play like a leading role no, in terms of electric mobility in, in Africa? Jambier, if you have any thoughts on this. Yeah, thank you very much. Actually, the key driver, if I can say, I can take it in the three angles. First of all, as I have said, um, uh, the transport, the, the way it is now, the current uh, transport system is based on the ICE. And we know uh, the disadvantage of, uh, of emission from ICE vehicles. Knowing that, and the number of, uh, you know, number of uh, uh, diseases linked to it, or the health problems that are linked to it, government of Rwanda, and also even the population try to understand that the way forward is uh, electric or less polluting vehicles. Again, looking at the global trend, the global trend, uh, Again, seeing how the, um, the country reliance on uh, fuel that is exported. So oh, we, we, we are in the game, if we are to use made in Rwanda product, which is the electricity that we are producing. So all of them combined, again, with the, the political push towards uh, mitigating uh, effect of greenhouse gases on the climate change and so on and so forth, and also linking uh, ourselves because Rwanda doesn't work uh, as an isolation country, an isolated country. It works at the global level. Looking at the uh, different um, agreements that the Rwanda has is a signatory, like Paris Agreement, Stockholm, and so on and so forth. Rwanda is much aware of the climate uh, uh, 
climate mitigation measures and so on and so forth. As a matter of fact, uh, Rwanda was the first country to uh, submit the, the mitigation, I mean, the uh, determined contribution in the UN because we are much aware of the climate mitigation measures and we wanted to be ahead because we have a lot to, to uh, we have a lot to gain than losing toward the shifting of electric mobility. So actually that was the, 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 the biggest push uh, associated with the uh, political willingness and again, the benefit that is associated in the reduction of emission and greenhouse gases, I think. Yeah, thanks, Jamie. No, no, I think it also shows you know, the importance of uh, being bold and having ambitious goals because that also attracts a lot of partners because as we could see from both Francois and Jamie's presentation, there's a lot of you know, World Bank, Institutes, Solutions Plus, many projects that uh, Rwanda has attracted with, with these ambitions and they're trying to support the country. So I think that's also, I think, a good uh, for me, like a, a lessons learned, right? Like if, if you put out ambitious goals and targets, uh, then it's also easier to get international support to to follow up on on these targets. Um, and then mm. one question that, because that uh, is is being asked a lot, and I think that's also to to Jambier, if you have done already uh, any assessment on the impact of the electricity grid, uh, if you move to, I think now you said updating to 100% electric motorcycles by 2030 and 20% buses. Uh, has this study been done already or is that something that uh, is currently um, in the pipeline? Because I guess now by, I think uh, Francois mentioned there's about uh, 756 or so electric vehicles at the moment. So I'm, I'm pretty sure at the moment there's there's not a huge impact on the grid. But of course later when if you move to larger scale that, that could be an, an issue. Yes, you, you are right. Uh, so far we, with the current fleet that we have, we haven't yet uh, experienced any issue with the grid. Uh, as a matter of fact, we have more excess on the electricity that is being produced now. So uh, adding uh, vehicles on the grid uh, as consumers or, or, yes, as consumers of electricity so far hasn't caused any problem. But of course, we anticipate to have some if the number of vehicles increases. So uh, the, 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 the uh, electricity utility has in plan because that falls under the ministry, uh, Ministry of Infrastructure as well. We know that um, at a certain point in the future, there should be uh, some um, problem that can be can affect the grid on distribution and even in generation. So uh, the energy utility is much aware of that and most of the time used to simulate and you see the grid, how it is working, what are the problems that are we are seeing on the grid, the water is the sources. So I think uh, once the number of vehicles is increasing, this is the continuous exercise that the uh, energy utility does in order to have the equilibrium and prevent that there should be a shortage or something linked to that. And again, uh, we are open to um, off-grid solutions as well, especially in rural areas uh, where uh, some uh, investments are being put in uh, are being put in uh, rural areas for off-grid uh, to provide, especially uh, not only on um, electric mobility but also for the cooking. So so far we haven't have any problem on the grid because of electric mobility uh, being included on the, on, on, on the consumption uh, and the energy utility is following up, following it up so that if there is something foreseeable, what, could, what can be the mitigation or the measure against it? Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Johnny, for this comprehensive answer. And I have one last question for you before I, I have uh, one or two more for Francois. Um, have you looked at the potential of electrifying corporate fleets? I think this also uh, could include you no know, fleets from the ministry, um, bigger companies. Is that something you you have looked into? Sorry, come again. Uh, if you have looked into uh, the electrification of corporate fleets or also the fleets from the ministries, the vehicles that you use 
Um, is that also being targeted? Yes, as I have said, you remember uh, in the presentation, uh, normally uh, how the structure, the fleet in the government is, we are zero fleet, meaning ministry doesn't own vehicles to, for the operation, but we hire. And if you remember very well in the presentation that I have I've shared with you, preference was given to operators having electric vehicles. And this is in, is in the tender that we have now that we are, uh, we, we launched uh, early this year, that when actually it will start, in, I think this July, uh, companies that are having electric vehicles to transport people, uh, uh, personnel or staff on duty will be given a priority. It is one of the incentives that was approved by the cabinet and it will be operational from this July. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Vincent. Yeah, it's good that you um, highlighted this again. And then uh, maybe a, a question to uh, Francois on the pilot uh, project that, that uh, I mean, they, they were in both presentations, but I think uh, Francois, since both of the pilots are, are being implemented in Kigali, um, can you maybe say something about the support that, that's been received by uh, World Bank IFC? Is that um, only right now for studies or the pilot phase, or is that also looking into how to, to scale up? Um, just yeah, maybe a quick thought on that. Yeah, currently they provide the, the the support for studies for both uh, IFC for e, e study, electric mobility study, but for the World Bank, the support for rest and memory connectivity as well as the introduction of DBL. So now we are we are trying to discuss how now we we, we bring buses something physical. Yeah, those are the ongoing discussions. Yeah, thanks. And very last question. Um, for you would be on uh, stakeholder engagement because um, now we, we've seen that there's many uh, companies and, and people on the table. Uh, what would you see was kind of the biggest challenge in like getting everybody to, to work together or have you not faced any, let's say, uh, complaints by anyone? Is everybody always on board or, or what was your experience kind of with engaging with all these different actors in, in the immobility e field in Kigali? I think currently there's no such challenge. We see people in trace to drain. People working in isolation. When you meet a change, for example, you don't know where to address the, the issue. So now, now it's, it's more easier and the discussing issues and moving forward is more easier. So currently, I don't think we'll have any time to bring people together. We are more interested in the first phase. Perfect. Great. That, that's uh, what I wanted to hear. Nice. Well, and we are we are right at the end of the, this uh, uh, meeting. I yeah, huge thanks to uh, David, Jambier, and Francois for their presentation insights, and to all of you that are in this meeting and that shared your present uh, your comments and questions, uh, that listened in. Um, I'm going to also put my uh, email address in the chat here again. If there's any follow up questions, or in case uh, you don't receive an email, but you should have an email from me soon with uh, the, the presentations and materials. Um, and uh, yeah, then I look forward to, to seeing you in, in one of the next sessions. And please also always feel free to reach out to me if you have any uh, suggestions on other topics that will be covered. If you have anything that you would like to share in a broader uh, group, uh, always happy to, to receive uh, questions, comments, suggestions, and tips uh, how to um, yeah, uh, offer uh, more training and support uh, to the education of uh, mobility in Africa. And with that, I'll thank you a lot and wish you a great rest of your day. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Anika. Bye-bye. Thank you, Anika. Bye-bye.